Great. Uh, thank you all for staying till the end. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak. Stan told me that the benefit of being the last speaker was that no one went after me so I could talk for as long as I wanted. And we have the room till eight, so that's great. So that gives me about two hours to talk about image registration. Everyone's on board with that, right? Okay, I'm kidding. Um, okay, so what I'd like to talk about now, so Carrie set up nicely all of the images that we can get for SRS and SBRT. There, since now we're doing SBRT, uh, SBRT on practically every site in the body, image registration is really the same as what we're doing for everything, just more strict criteria. We have less tolerance, we need more certainty, we have higher resolution images, we need to know the motion more, we need to know the setup more, we need to integrate more images together, and we need to make sure that we're doing IGRT accurately. Um, so this is going to be the end for today, but then tomorrow morning, Sonia Dietrich and Indra Nchetti are going to be basically using this image registration to look at geometric and dosimetric uncertainties. Okay, so acknowledgments and conflicts of interest. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the members of the AAPM Task Group 132, Sasha Mutic, Mark Kessler, uh, Hua Lee and Todd McNutt, and also disclose that I have a licensing agreement with for deformable registration technology with Research. So the objectives that I was asked to cover for this talk are to describe how specifically deformable but really all image registration algorithms work, describe the techniques to commission and validate image registration in the clinic, and these are really the preliminary recommendations for TG132. And I'll just give you a quick update right now that the task group is in its last stages before approval, so science, it's in science council right now, so I'm really hoping in the next month we will be able to have approval for AAPM, and once we get that, then we can make it available on the website and make the phantom data that I'll talk about and then illustrate some of the concepts with clinical examples. So I'll try to tie in some of that as we go through, um, but really that's gonna be even more tomorrow with um, how these are used in the clinic. So let's talk about techniques. So how does image registration work? This could really, if I really wanted to go over this, this could be its own two and a half day course, but I just wanted to give some basic overview and some of the most predominantly used algorithms. So essentially image registration, needs to match something, and then it needs to constrain it by some kind of function. When we started talking about image registration in radiation oncology, oftentimes at AAPM, you would see this image of Britney Spears morphing into Arnold Schwarzenegger was one of the very popular ones. And that should really concern everyone because we don't want to morph a prostate into a brain or a liver into a pancreas. So we really need to constrain it by something that's realistic. And that's really what separates you know, the Britney Spears into Arnold Schwarzenegger with what we're doing in the clinic. So when we match something, we can match lots of different aspects of the image. We can match the intensity, the gradients, the boundaries, the features in the image, and then when we constrain it by some kind of function, that can be an approximation or something that's closer to the actual patient. So it can be geometric, it can be physical, but not physical as in the actual patient, or it can be biomechanical, which is really as close as we can get to the patient. So the things we need to ask ourselves as physicists who are going to be leading these initiatives in our clinic is what happens when the intensity correspondence varies between the image? What happens when we have a beautiful contrast enhanced MR scan and we're matching that to a cone beam CT scan with the streak artifacts that we've heard about? What happens when the gradient is not there in one of the images, when the boundaries aren't as well defined, or when the features aren't visible? And then when we constrain it by a function and we pick which function, how much can we rely on that function when the above matching intensities and gradients aren't there? So we really need to be able to understand what those limitations are. So this is just a kind of a brief summary of all of the metrics that we can use, the transformations and the optimization. And like I said, due to some of the time constraints, I'm going to only go over some of the most popular ones. So I kind of listed these going from the simplest to the most complex. So since we've obtained images in the clinic, we've been doing image registration. So that used to be by eye that we would get a film, we would put it up on the light box, compare it to our simulation film, use our eye and say, okay, looks like it's a couple of centimeters off and rely on our brain power. And now we've gotten more sophisticated. We can do point-based alignments, we can do chamber matching, which is really a surface matching, 
contour, mean square difference, correlation coefficient, down to mutual information, which is the most complex mathematical operation that we can do. And all of these have different benefits and different uses in our clinic. So least squares or points is very quick. It's easy and it's very local. This is great for seeds implanted in the prostate. Uh, chamber matching is great because it's surface, so a lot of times we're really interested in the surface of an organ or the surface of our tumor. Contour matching can be manual or auto-segmentation. Mean square difference is really great for 40 CT where the image was obtained at the exact same time, so the intensity is the same and it's also very quick. Correlation coefficient is great when you have the same modality but different levels of contrast, so you need to kind of equalize those out. And then mutual information is really what we need when we're talking about integrating MR into a CT-based planning system. So these are the, I, what I think are the top three similarity metrics that you'll typically find in commercial-based systems. Some of the square differences, mutual information, and contour propagation. So some of the square differences is really quite easy. You have CT scan one, you have CT scan two, you subtract those and that's your difference. And so you just keep moving these, this second image around until you get the minimum of this. So you're, you constrain it by some transformation and that can either be rigid transformation or deformable and then you optimize using very similar optimization algorithms as we use for IMRT to find the minimum of this. So very simple, again, works great when you have the same contrast between two images because what you really want is a completely black image. But if we substitute in an MR for one of those CT scans, now we can never get a zero difference image. And of course, this really doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And so we need something that's more sophisticated. And that's where mutual information comes in. So I'm not going to dive into all of the mathematics here, but it really is maximizing what is consistent between the two, two images using joint probability distributions. So it calculates the marginal entropies, the information that's in both images, and then the joint entropy or the information that's consistent between the two to get the mutual information. So it's very interesting to dive a little bit more into these metrics and see how sensitive they are. And so some great work um, was done, as I mentioned in the reference on the previous slide, and I just have some simple plots here. So let's imagine that we're plotting the mutual information as a function of moving two images across from each other. And so if you imagine that my hands were images as we were moving across, you get closer and closer, and then you get your zero, and then you get farther and farther. So that's what I'm illustrating here. So if we do that, we get a very clear minimum mutual information. So this is the best solution. Our optimization would find that very easily, give that to you, and you would be very happy with the answer. The problem is our distributions are not often like that. We may get something like this. And the, the real problem with getting something like this, one is that you may get stuck in these local minimum, but the other problem is that this is a best solution, this is a best solution, this is a best solution, and this is a best solution and that one too. So the problem with this is which one of these is right and how do you know that? Because when you look at this, it may also look very right. So when do we see that in a clinical scenario? So here we have a CT scan and a cone beam CT scan of a lung image. You can see that they're offset and you can see that they're aligned. And this is like the first uh, distribution that I showed you. You lock on, you have a very clear gradient. But here, this is a liver CT scan and a liver cone beam CT scan, and we see all of this uniform intensity on both of these. So if we correlated here with here, we would get basically the same information as correlating here to here, because all of this is the same. So over here, we have a high potential for accurate registration, and over here, we have a high potential for errors in registration. So this is where we need to take that information and be mindful of it when we use it in our clinic. Moving on to the next similarity metric, this is contour matching. Here's an example of two prostate images, a lung image, um, and a liver image. So our first SAMS question, measuring the similarity of alignment of multimodality images is complex, typically requiring the use of A, some of the square differences, B, guessing, G, mutual information, D, mean square difference, or E, the cube subtracted less one. <laughs> 
I love answering my own questions because I always get them right. All right, and most of you also got it right. Excellent, very good job. Um, so when we have multimodality images, we really need to rely on mutual information because it looks at the probability dis distribution in the image and not the actual um, individual image intensity. And here's uh, the reference of the first mutual information paper that came out back in 1997. So now we have our way that we're going to look at the images and rather than use our eye, use a mathematical concept to determine whether they are matched. So once we do that, if we want to do something that's more sophisticated than a rigid registration, which gives us left-right motion, AP motion, and SUPIMP motion, and we want to allow deformable registration, we need to decide how we are going to make sure that the neighboring voxels don't just scramble. So how do we prevent our registration algorithm from deforming Britney Spears into Arnold Schwarzenegger. So these are the three most popular ones that you will find in um, many of the commercially available systems. The first is thin plate splines or B splines, and these are really weighted basis splines or functions. The second is a flow or an optical, and this is gradient driven with regularization. So this you'll often hear of the Demons algorithm. And then the last one is elastic or biomechanical. And this uses material properties or estimates of the tissue, the compressibility, and the stiffness. OK, so this is a great graphic that Mark Kessler gave me to illustrate the use of thin plate splines. So the important thing to remember about thin plate splines is it's global. So if you are using an algorithm that has thin plate splines, you need to know that any of the points that you use is going to have an impact on every point in your image. So this can be good because it allows kind of a global deformation so you don't get a lot of crazy distortion and it's a very strong regularizer. But the problem is if you have a lung tumor that's sliding along a rib cage, this is going to have a lot of limitation in that process. That's where B splines comes in. So B splines allows you to have kind of individual weighting um, splines, and this gives you more flexibility in your deformation. So the more splines you have, the more your overall deformation can vary. So if I go to the next slide, um, you can see how this works. So as we change the weighting here, you can see that over here is not being impact. So there's a, a localization of the impact, a degree for which it affects um, across that, and then you can, or the algorithm will edit these and, and change the deformation. And so this is basically the uh, a single plane deformation, or the DX, okay? If we go to biomechanical, this is an example um, of the biomechanical model-based algorithm that I developed. So it basically takes images and converts them into finite element models, and then you can assign different material properties and different biomechanics to it. So in the lung case, you can make the bronchial tree with shell elements and design the stiffness and the compressibility of those, the stiffness and compressibility of the elements in the parenchyma of the lung, and a contact surface. So you can actually define the sliding mechanism and the coefficient of friction in between the lung and the um, chest wall. So here's just an example um, of that. So this is an example of an inhale to an exhale. So we're modeling the breathing motion and the breathing motion at each of the cone beam CT images. Um, so just to give you an example of how this plays out for a clinical example for SBRT. So a lot of times we think that adaptive and dose accumulation may not make a big difference in SBRT cases. Well, this is an example of a retrospective evaluation of the dose accumulation for 30 patients. So it's 30, 40 cone beam CT data sets. And what we found was that 70% of these 30 patients had an accumulated dose deviation of greater than 5% compared to the static plan on exhale. And then this was followed up by another study that just um, was accepted in press in the Red Journal, where we accumulated the dose to the tumor. So we compared the minimum dose to the GTV 
which you could do if you calculate the delivered dose compared to the planned dose, minimum dose to the PTV, and found that the accumulated dose to the GTV, so the point of doing all this accumulated dose, gave you a better correlation with the total time to local, co co local progression compared to the minimum PTV dose. So using these more sophisticated tools, even in the case of a small number of fractions, can be very beneficial as we move forward with the clinical trials that we heard about in the clinical sessions earlier today. Okay, so another Sam's question. This is a true or false one. Thought I'd go easy on you guys. The potential benefit of B splines compared to thin plate splines is a more local and less global flexibility of the deformation. Great. 88% of you um, remembered that the B splines were the individual splines that didn't have the global impact compared to the thin plate splines. That's too bad, because I was going to say if we got 100%, then they were going to roll in the beer cart, but no luck. Okay, so now hopefully I've given you a brief overview. I realize that that's not a comprehensive overview of everything that you could possibly need to know, but there's a lot of great information from previous talks that were given at AAPM and APM summer schools on the virtual library. So if you feel like you need more information, I highly recommend that you take a look at some of those previous presentations. So what I'd like to do now is go forward and talk about the recommendations that, again, are pending approval from Science Council at AAPM from TG 132, so hopefully um, this will get approved and we'll all be ready to go when these, this data is released. So we have six clinical recommendations, and the thing that I would like to point out is that we were very mindful as we developed the task group recommendations to try to make this a very practical document, that we could really defend all of the recommendations that we had as really needing to be done in the clinic and not something that would be, you know, that would take a physicist uh, two months of dedicated time in order to roll out. So the first is to understand the basic image registration techniques and methods of visualizing image fusion, uh, which we've hopefully done here, and I've pointed you to more uh, virtual library presentations. To understand the basic components of the registration algorithm used clinically in your system to ensure its proper use. So it's very important that you talk to your vendor, that you read the white papers, that you read any other papers that have been published using that algorithm. And then when you get the system to perform end-to-end -end tests of image registration and the planning and treatment delivery systems if image registration is performed on a standalone system. So if you're getting an independent system, then you'll need to do this as an end-to-end -end test. If it's part of your treatment planning system, then you've already done an end-to-end -end test in the commissioning of your treatment planning system. Then the fourth is to perform a comprehensive commissioning of image registration using the provided digital phantom data that will be available on the APM website or similar data. You certainly don't have to use the data that we provide, as well as clinical data from your institution. So this is really important that everyone's institution, your workflow, your process is different. So it's important that you do something specific to your institution as well to develop a request and report system to ensure communication and documentation between all of the users of image registration. So image registration is really one of those things that everyone has a hand in as you go through either doing it, the data that's coming into it, or the uses of it once it's done. And then to establish a patient-specific QA practice for efficient evaluation of the image registration results. So if we think of commissioning and QA as filling up this whole picture, we first need to start with understanding the fundamental components of the algorithm. Um, and to do that, again, the task group report has some basic pieces, and the AAPM virtual library has lots, and there's several review papers and books that have been published. And then to understand the components of your algorithm. So at a minimum, the vendors, and we've provided this recommendation for several years going forward, and all of them, I believe, are now complying with this, that they should disclose the similarity metric that's used, the regularization that's used, the transformation that's used, the optimization method, and what knobs you can turn. So this is really important. If you don't like the image registration results, how can you tweak those, and how can you potentially make it better? And then, of course, to read any white papers that they have 
So why do we need to know the implementation? Because implementation really matters in our use of it. So this was a great study that was done by Mark Oldham and Shiva Das at Duke, where they got this, they developed this deformable 3D presage dosimeter. So if I could just take a minute to describe it, this is what it looks like. And so when you irradiate this, it changes the material properties that you can read out on an optical CT scan, but you can't see it um, on the image. So they took this and they irradiated this grid pattern as a baseline of it. And then they took another do a dosimeter and they compressed it with a 27% lateral compression. And then they irradiated a grid onto that. And then they, they took this, so this is the data of what it looked like read out on the optical CT scanner, but on the standard image that they put into the deformable registration, you couldn't see all of this information. You could only see the boundary of the, um, the gel. So they put that into a commercially available deformable registration and said, deform this compressed versus uncompressed system. And these are the actual results and this is the deformable registration results. And so you can see what's happening. There was no intensity variation on the inside of this image. And so because of the regularization, it just stretched this. So we see a lot of differences between what it actually should map the dose to and what it did map the dose to. So the results of this is that we really must use caution when we're using intensity-based registration algorithms that have a general geometric regularizer when accumulating dose, especially in regions of homogeneous intensity. So you're not going to see these kind of results very likely in cases like lung, where you have lots of contrast variation across the bronchial tree compared to the air. But again, when you look at that liver case and you see a very homogeneous liver on a non contrast enhanced CT scan and especially on your cone beam CT scan or you can think of many of the sites in the abdomen or the interior of the prostate. Um, there's lots of sites that we would need to be concerned with this and the bigger that organ is the more room you have to have that distortion. But if we look at a comparison, so here's the gold standard and this is where that control comes in. So they looked at a 3D gamma index and then I did a collaboration with uh, Mark and Shiva and they sent the data to us and we ran it through our biomechanical based method. So this is the intensity based, had a 3D gamma matrix uh, metric of 60%. And we re ran this through the biomechanical, which we measured the material properties and assigned those. We had a 3D gamma index of 91%. So again, every algorithm has different kinds of limitations, but one of the benefits, as we see here, for a biomechanical model is that when you can assign those material properties, it can overcome some of the limitations when you have a homogeneous region. So the next step is a phantom approach to understanding the characteristics of the algorithm limitation. So as I mentioned, performing end-to-end -end tests is very important, and this is part of previous task group reports where they recommend that you um, do these end-to-end -end tests. So TG53 provides this recommendation. So how do we need to do the end-to-end -end test? Do we need to go out and buy a sophisticated phantom? No, we can really use any simple phantom or solid water that's just marked. So the point of this is to make sure that you don't have two wrongs making a right. That left becomes left through all of your planning systems, that the voxel size maintains the same, the um, intensity values stay the same as you go through that process. So the validation tests and frequencies that we recommend in TG132 uh, at acceptance and commissioning that you perform end-to-end -end tests and make sure that they're accurate as well as data transfer using physics phantoms. And then annually or upon upgrade of your system, you perform the rigid registration accuracy with the digital phantoms or a subset and that you're still at baseline from your commissioning the deformable registration accuracy, and then example clinical cases. So why did we recommend that we do this annually, even if no part of your system has changed? And that's really just a subset of it, because we looked at it from two rationales. So most people feel that they're either uh, one of a small number of physicists in their department, and so they know everything that goes on in terms of ma machine change. You know, if something happens to your CT scanner, you know because you did it. And so the purpose of looking at this annually is to have a bit of a timeout and make sure that you still remember the limitations and the uncertainties in this process and that nothing has kind of had that creep where we're over, uh, 
estimating the accuracy and the process of this. And if you are one of many physicists in a large institution, then this is a good opportunity to make sure that you know, your physicist down the hall didn't change some part of the process and didn't let you know, so then it's impacting your um, focus, which may be the image registration. So why virtual phantoms? Virtual phantoms are great because they have known attributes. We know the volume, we know the offset, we know the deformation of every single voxel for some of them. It allows us to test standardization so that we're all using the exact same data. We can have geometric phantoms with quantitative validation or we can have anthropomorphic with realistic and quantitative validation. So we were fortunate to get uh, to have a collaboration between TG132 and IMSIM QA where they allowed us to develop and make available to the medical physics community a small subset of phantom data sets. So this really helps us to learn the impact of the knobs of registration that our vendors are providing for us. And this is an example of a rigid geometric data set. So you can see it's very unambiguous. It's very clear what we're looking at. This is not your you know, hazy liver in a cone beam CT. So I liken this to a 20 by 20 field profile. So this is your really basics. What are you doing? Do you understand how this works? This is just another view of that. And this is an example. So when we were writing the report, I said, okay, let me take this and see how it works. Um, we were just using a new treatment planning system that I hadn't used before. And so I put this data set in, I ran it through. So this is the expected deviation, 10 millimeters in X, five millimeters in Y, 15 millimeters in Z. And I ran this through a few times and I got varying results. And I was really surprised. I'm like, this is unambiguous. This should be really clear. They should be bang on every single time. And then I realized that the default settings, the final resolution was two millimeters, and so it wasn't locking on to that one millimeter. So if I went in, changed the knobs, added a fourth step with a one millimeter resolution, then on all, almost all of them except for one, which was 0.1 millimeters off, I got exactly what I was expecting. So that's where this is, a, you know, it's very simple. It takes just a few minutes to run this test, and it allows you to make sure that you understand some of the basic fundamentals of your uh, image registration. Then we move up a layer of complexity to a rigid anatomical phantom. So this is a prostate case. It will be available in multimodality. So CT, uh, T1 and T2 MRI, um, and cone beam CT. And it is anatomically correct. So then we take that image and we deform it. So we inflated the rectum and we deformed the prostate and provided a shift and a rotation. And what we are, then you can do with that is you know the deformation, you know the motion that is defined for every single voxel. So we can run the deformable registration algorithm and then export the deformation vector field using DICOM format. And then we provide you with some pseudocode if you don't have code of your own or if it's not included in your, deform in your um, commercial package. So you can do a direct comparison between the known deformation vector field, again, of every voxel in the image and what your deformable registration has come up with. So the target for this was difficult to come up with. What were we gonna set as the ideal criteria? So we were aggressive with this. We said that the ideal criteria would be that 95% of the voxels would be within two millimeters with a max error of less than five. So the point of this is to say, this is where we really wanna be. If we had this kind of accuracy, then we would be within the dose grid for all of the image. But we state in the document that this is likely not going to be achievable by any of the commercially available systems currently as they stand. And so if we don't have that, then it allows us as physicists the opportunity to say, how am I going to incorporate these uncertainties in the process that's downstream? So if I'm using this to integrate an MR with a CT, then how am I going to assess that and how am I going to incorporate that? Am I going to, what is going to be my mechanism to include that into the PTB? And that's something that's important. So virtual phantoms can only really get us some of the way there. So we also collaborated with Dr. Castillo at the DIR lab when he was at MD Anderson, and he allowed us to make available one of their 40 CT data sets that has 476 landmarks that were selected. So this is a huge number of landmarks. You can see how well distributed they are across the lung. This is a pretty average motion case with an average motion of about a centimeter and a max motion of 1.5 
five centimeters. And so you can take this case and run it through your deformable registration algorithm and export it out and look at how your displacement from your deformable registration algorithm compares with the known displacement of these 476. So now you don't have the displacement of every single voxel, but you have a large number and with a lung case compared to a prostate case. So this just summarizes the target tolerance for the rigid phantoms, a half of the voxel uh, dimension, and then with the deforming phantoms, 95% of the voxels within two millimeters. Again, with the asterisk there that says when you don't reach that, how are you going to account for these uncertainties as you go forward? So the next step, once you've kind of understood that with the phantom approach, is to look at your clinical images. What site are you going to be rolling deformable registration out in first, and how are you going to be using it? Are you going to use it to combine MR with CT for treatment planning? Are you going to use it for dose accumulation? Are you going to use it for adaptive radiotherapy? What process are you going to have, and how are you going to commission that? So how do we do that with our um, actual clinical data sets. So what tools do we have? Visual verification is an excellent tool for established techniques. So this is an example of a cone beam CT down at the treatment unit where you need something very fast and you can identify the uncertainties. But this is not enough for commissioning. So for commissioning, we do need to spend some amount of time and work to make sure that our uh, clinical subset of our data has accuracy that we're aware of. So there's basically three main ways to quantitatively validate our clinical data sets. One is landmark based, and that is does the registration map a landmark on image A to the correct position on image B, and this is target registration error. The second is contour based. Does the registration map the contours onto the new image correctly? We can quantify that with dice similarity coefficient or mean distance to agreement and then the digital and physical phantoms that I previously described. So this is an illustration of target registration error. There's the reproducibility that we need to take into account of picking that landmark, and um, it is a manual technique, uh, which is why it's great that we have those, that data set from the DIR lab. So here's an example. Here's an inhale image. We can identify that point, and here's the exhale image. We can identify the corresponding point. So here's point A, here's point B. We do the deformable registration. That maps point A here, which becomes point A prime because it's went through the deformable registration. And then we quantify the difference, the vector difference between those two points. And that, once we average that across all of our points, is the target registration error. So picking these points for a case like lung is really pretty easy. You can pretty quickly identify 15 points, five, five, and five across the um, apex, the mid, and the lower part of the lung pretty quickly in each of the lungs, and I think that's a pretty good general um, estimate of your accuracy in the lung. So that sounds great. Is that enough? Um, and I use this as a caution of limitation of points. So these are four markers that were, or sorry, three markers that were placed in a prostate and imaged on two different days. So the X um, is the three markers on day one, and the circle is the mark for the same patient midway through treatment. And this is a prostate case that was imaged on an MR scanner, so the contour of the prostate was very clear. This is one centimeter, so the RMS error between these points is 0.3 millimeters. So I think we'd probably all agree that this looks pretty accurate. We'd be pretty confident going forward and treating this patient that they, their uh, anatomy was correctly aligned. But points don't tell the whole story. So here's the actual prostate boundary. So despite the fact that the markers are all well aligned, this is the rectal interface, and this is a one centimeter difference between the boundary of the prostate due to uh, rectal filling between the two of these. So this is especially concerning when you think that the majority of the prostatic burden is in the interface with the rectum. So we need to use caution. This is an extreme case, but we need to use caution when we are using points to validate our anatomical position of patients. So our third and final SAMS question. Target registration error is defined as A, the uncertainty in selecting landmarks on an image. B, the average residual error between identified points on study B and the points identified on study A mapped onto study A prime through image registration. C, improvement in accuracy when using deformable registration over rigid registration. D, the volume overlap of two contours on a, rigid, on a registered image. Or E, the mean surface distance between two contours on registered images. <laughs> 
Um, so the answer there is B. It's the average residual error between the identified points on study B and the points identified on study A mapped onto study A prime through the image registration. So the last part is documentation and evaluation on in the clinical environment. And you heard a little bit about this previously um, when Martha and Mary were giving their um, presentations. So the recommendations of TG132 are to provide a request. So clear identification of the image sets to be registered and identification of the primary image geometry an understanding of the local regions of importance. And this is really critically important when we're limited, especially when we're limited to rigid registration. The intended use of the result, is it for target delineation? Is it for dose accumulation? Is it for adaptive? The techniques to be used, deformable or rigid, and the accuracy required for the final use. I don't know how many physicists have spent a ton of time trying to perfect the image registration as good as possible, and they show it to the physician expecting them to carefully look through it, and they say, oh, I just wanted to map it on in general so I could get a, you know, a quick overview. So we really want to be able to use our, our resources adequately. And you've seen this um, earlier where this is what we've included in our simulation directive. So I had a few people ask me out in the hallway, where did we put this? How did we get our physicians to use it? We try to make it as easy as possible. So they have to fill out the simulation directive before the patient gets simulated, and so that's where we put it. We used checkboxes, and then we, we helped them to realize that the more they use this, the better registration results they were going to get, and the less work that they would have to do doing the image registration. Because in our clinic, the dosimetrists typically do the first pass of the image registration. They may consult physics, and then finally the physicians review that. So putting this somewhere where they already are definitely going makes it much easier and really improves the workflow and the results. So once the image registration is done, then a report should be generated. This doesn't have to be a complicated report. It should just describe the images that were actually used. So this can be in conjunction with your previous report, just claiming that, yes, that's what you did. Indicate the accuracy of the registration for local regions. Verify that acceptable tolerances were met for use. Um, the techniques that were performed for registration and the fused images with a report of annotations and documentation from the system used for fusion. And so the other thing that TG132 wanted to do is to try to provide a common language for everyone to use in terms of accuracy. So how accurate was this registration? And so we came up with these uncertainty assessments that were zero to four, a simple phrase, and then a description. So an uncertainty level zero is the whole scan is aligned to sub-voxel level. So this is really your invasive frame SRS system where you can get the anatomy to one millimeter everywhere, locally aligned, usable with a risk of deformation, usable for diagnosis only, and then alignment not acceptable. So this is really if you're, you have a surgical intervention in between the two images and you really, the, the alignment really makes no sense and should not be saved. So here's a clinical example of an SBRT patient on the importance of assessing the accuracy. So deformable image registration for multimodality planning. As you heard previously, we do a lot of liver in our clinic. So here's a CT scan with no contrast, and you cannot see, this is a stent, not the tumor. You can't see the tumor anywhere. This is an MRI with contrast. Um, the window leveling is in the projection probably isn't the greatest, but the tumor is visible inside of this red um, contour. So when we do the image registration, if this is off, so this is what we're planning on. Once we do the image registration, we're never going to look at the MR scan again. So this is going to map it on. So any mismapping of this tumor is going to create a systematic error that's going to propagate through the entire treatment. So this is really a critical step in the use of it. So how do we assess that? So this, if we take a step back from that clinical case and use a case where we have all of the information. Here's a case where we have contrast in the CT and contrast in the MR. And so this is after a rigid registration, but before deformable, and this is after the deformable registration. So you can see that if you only use rigid registration, then you have this bit of an offset between the two. So if we go through an animation of that, let's pretend like this is like the previous case and we can't see the tumor on the CT scan. So here's our MR tumor that we can see. Here's our CT tumor that we're going to pretend like we can't see. So in this case, the, we would contour the MR and map that onto the CT. And so that's what we're going to treat. 
But then this is all of the region of the CT defined GTV that we would miss in this scenario. So this is, again, with a rigid registration, not deformable registration. So this, if this is indeed tumor, as we've identified on the CT scan, would be something that we would miss. So it's important that we look at that image registration and account for any uncertainty. So if there's no if there's no visible anatomical landmarks near the tumor and you can't see the tumor, then you may want to add an uncertainty margin on there, especially if you see evidence of deformation outside of that. So assess the uncertainty around the GTV and potentially add a margin around the GTV to account for that uncertainty when required. So establish a patient-specific QA practice for efficient evaluation of the results. And why do we need to do that? At this point, we're still understanding how the registration is performing on different types of patients. So it's really, again, it's very similar to doing IMRT QA, is to make sure, okay, for this patient, are things behaving as we expect them to be? How do we do that? Visual verification, spot checks of landmarks, boundary comparison. There's a lot of tools in the commercial systems to make us be able to do these processes very fast. And the more accuracy that we need for what we're doing, the more you're going to want to do this. So if you're really, really pushing on the boundary constraints and really integrating multimodality imaging, doing some spot checks of some landmarks may not be a bad idea, especially when you're just starting out with a deformable registration. Briefly, these are the vendor recommendations that we've provided in order to make our life as physicists easier, um, to disclose the basic components, to provide the ability to export the registration matrix out in the DICOM format, to provide tools to quantitatively evaluate the image registration, to provide the ability to identify landmarks to calculate the TRE, to provide the ability to calculate the dice similarity coefficient or the mean distance to agreement for the contours, and to support the integration of a request and report system in the image registration process. So hopefully the TG132 product will help us all um, in our jobs in incorporating this technology safely into our clinic to provide some guidelines, some phantoms, so we don't have to generate all of this on our own. Again, it's not going to be a complete set, uh, but it will help us get started. And some recommendations for periodic and patient-specific QA and QC, and some recommendations for the clinical process. So in summary, deformable registration is a powerful tool that can help us to integrate multimodality images to understand motion and to quantify anatomical changes and compute an improved estimate of the delivered dose. But with power becomes responsibility and we must commission the system prior to use and to understand the limitations and communicate these to all of our colleagues, both upstream and downstream of the registration process. And hopefully TG132 can help provide some tools and some guidance and some workflows in order to make this process simpler. Thank you for your attention.